Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Art Roundtable, which is a, a course that, that, uh, that I teach f uh, for the graduate program in curatorial practice at the School of Visual Arts. I'm David Ross. And uh, every week on Tuesdays, usually some point in the day, uh, generally at 5 p.m. in Eastern time, but sometimes earlier or later, depending on where the artist we're talking with uh, is, uh, is working. Uh, we have a one hour presentation and then, and then we have a private conversation with the graduate students enrolled in the program. Uh, but uh, we're, we're happy to be able to share this part of the class with the, with the public, with the SVA community. Today, we're really lucky and happy to have uh, an artist who uh, I've become very interested in, uh, named Neri, uh, Neri Gabriel Linus. Uh, and Neri was born in LA in, in the late 1970s. And so uh, part of that generation that kind of grew up uh, in the US uh, after the Vietnam War, which is uh, you know a real dividing point in in a way between uh, the kind of population people who who were in the United States during uh, or aware and an adult during during the uh, during the Vietnam War and participated in one way or another and those people born afterwards and it's a, it's a really interesting generational shift. Uh, and Neri's, Neri's got his BFA at uh, you know at Art Center in uh, which is a really great school in Pasadena, and then got his MFA at uh, the at Cal Arts in Valencia in uh, 2009. Um, and you know so he's part of that that also that really special generation of, of artists who uh, got to uh, work and study around people like Mike Kelly and John Baldessari and the like and a kind of a storied time in California art school history. Uh, he's been uh, he's been featured in dozens of, of group exhibitions and some really interesting solo exhibitions, including one that I hope he talks about at one of my favorite uh, uh, alternative or artist run spaces in the country, the Row House Project in Houston, Texas. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it, he's um, he's continuing to work on the kind of subjects that have been of, of central to, to his practice, issues of immigration, issues of, 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 of ethnic stereotyping, issues of family and, 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 and of spirit, uh, you know, and, and, and faith in terms of uh, uh, issues that, uh, that are central to uh, the lives of people who uh, recognize the kind of connect, the connections that exist in the world. So it's, it's with great pleasure that I get to uh, introduce you to Neri Lamus. Uh, so Neri, if you want to um, take the screen, I will disappear until you're done with your presentation and then I'll come back up at the, to say goodbye to everybody. Okay, uh, actually, let me do this real quick. All right, well, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, all of you through this platform. I'm excited to just share my practice with you all. Um, obviously, many of your students, or if not all of your students, um, that are in this field of uh, curatorial practice. So maybe at some point in the future we'll work together. So um, <laughs> let's <you> hope so. <laughs> that, that's the that's the way it works. I believe me. There's been a lot of like instances where I meet people, and all of a sudden, yeah, remember you came to visit? I was like, oh shoot. Uh, <laughs> Really wonderful, but I'll spend some time talking about my work. My work deals with a lot of um, identity and uh, social issues, so I'll be kind of addressing that. I think it's in you know for someone who is in a curatorial practice program, um, it's uh, it's good to see how you know the artist who deals with social issues navigates you know creating that work and how you as someone who potentially will be a curator, how you curate that in a show. I think there's always a lot of conversations about, you know, who gets to voice for who um, and how to be, um, how to be ethical and how to be sensitive to a lot of the, the topics that are being presented within this body of work as well. So um, I'm, I'd like to start with this image. Uh, my mother, who you see pictured there, uh, clean houses when I was growing up and she used to take me as a little kid. Now that's something that is not heard of. Um, you don't hear a lot of um, and the lady that she in this one particular home, she was an amazing person and um, she treated us like family. 
And uh, the little boy, uh, that's Donnie, who was about close to my age, maybe just a little bit older. But I remember growing up with a lot of the grandchildren, and these were my early um, experiences to these sort of cross-cultural um, moments that have informed my, my practice as an adult. Of course, there's a lot of positive things about these experiences. Uh, and then there's some things that really started to, you know, cement in me that unfortunately there are these sort of like socioeconomic differences and sometimes you know, it really affects us, um, uh, you know, particularly, you know, pe people of color, right? So in this situation, um, we grew up playing as kids. And then when I got older, I kind of started to feel like I was the help son, even though Mary Pat used to always sit us at the same table. There were still, um, there's still those differences. The kids started to not play with us as much as they got older and got their friends and they'll be hanging out. So that really shaped my sort of interest in, uh, you know, speaking about these sort of experiences that were shared amongst a lot of people that I, that I knew. Um, so essentially dealing with conflict, I want to show you this body of work. This is, I always start with this because this is the body of work I did uh, in undergrad when uh, at my thesis show, I was really, interested in exploring this sort of acrimonious relationship that I was that I sort of that I did experience as a kid between African Americans and and Latinos here in Los Angeles particularly and um so I've always believed not always but as soon as I kind of got this sort of understanding about identity I believe that identity is something that is not fixed Identity is something that continues to evolve and change as we come in contact with different people, different culture groups, <clears throat> different sort of like subcultures, different music, foods, experienced foods. And so I wanted to highlight that within this poster. Uh, this is a barbershop poster. If you go to a black barbershop, you will see that... Um, the these the the barbershop poster that you see is usually young black men and uh if you go to latino barbershop you'll see that it's young latino men and these haircuts and you could select which one uh you want to get but i wanted to create one where both inhabit the same space at the time uh, i believe this is like uh 2007 uh i was seeing a lot of this lined up fade i even started to have that i don't now you know i have this you know, different type of hairstyle, but I had, I had my hair lined up and I had it very short. I would wear it like this. And um, I was interested in how someone could share the same experiences, right? And um, it's kind of done like a chest in that sort of grid fashion. Um, one, to create this sort of contrast, but also to, to, to give this place of, you know, I guess the players within this sort of like whole you know, situation, and to put them in very close proximity. Again, you look at their faces, they're very, um, you know, uh, there's a sort of serenity to them, which I, I really enjoy, and the sort of intimacy in the way they're placed. And then when I, um, I decided to have those posters and enter and put them inside barber shops. So the intervention continued. There was an intervention there where I would put these posters where they would no, normally wouldn't exist. And this was the barber shop. Uh, Kenny, the guy with the, the Jackson uh, jersey, he used to cut my hair. Um, and it was just a different experience, you know, how they, they uh, black barber shops cut hair and Latino barber shops cut hair. And, um, but I love the fact that we could kind of participate in this sort of experience. Um, and my my view was like, what happens if one, one cultural group goes into the other's implied space? The exhibition uh, space looked like this. There is uh, that one photograph was on the other side. I had this painting, which was actually our barber pole that's on its side. Um, to sort of, you know, the whole show is called Follow Nature in the Two Cities, which is uh, also a text by St. Augustine that 
kind of deals with these, you know, uh, tension between these two places. So essentially, that's what I was kind of uh, hinting at there. And then if you look at the background, that's a projection of this video I did. Um, and I have uh, some film stills here. In the video, what I'm doing is exploring um, more intimately these spaces. So you would see, um, I began by filming um, young black men getting their haircuts in black barbershops, then filming young Latino men getting uh, their haircuts in Latino barbershops, particularly in East LA, Boyle Heights area. And then I switched it around. I had some of my black friends go into Latino barbershops to get their haircut and vice versa. And the experiences that happened there were really, really interesting that, um, you know, pointed to this whole way of how identity is formed and uh, these misconceptions that people have um, just through the act of cutting hair. Um, and also just to see like what you would consider um, two groups that perhaps are not getting along, one receiving the haircut, like in this sort of situation. And and receiving a haircut is such an like an intimate sort of like situation. So there's 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 power in that. And here's my my friend Steve at uh, in a barbershop in East LA uh getting his haircut. Uh let me see here, a little bit of the video. sort of uh, a, a lot of um, painterly, very intimate sort of moments in the video. But also some of the conversation that happens uh, in the background that I thought was very important. Um, one of them, which was really interesting, I remember going to uh with my friend Steve here this this sort of scene. Um I walked into the barbershop and you know I, I told him that I was doing this project and um if I could film, yeah. And he says, Yeah, come in, you could, you know, we'll give you a haircut. I said, It's not for me, it's for my friend. And the, you know, and the guy was like, Well, we don't cut that type of hair here. And I, you know, I I felt, you know, bothered by it. I felt hurt. I was like, dang, did I just mess up that I put a, a create a bad situation but then he he said i have a friend who does and they called him over and then he was asking all the right questions do i cut with the grain against the grain do you get bumps and it turns out that the guy was um incarcerated and and in that experience he was a barber and he would cut everyone's uh hair but when he, when he would cut the young black men's hair he would mess it up and then finally he says, you and he would get into fights. And he said, I'm done fighting you guys. Why don't you show me how to cut the hair? So he learned how to cut the hair. You know, those things are beautiful, those those sort of experiences. But that's what this this whole project was about, is, is uh creating bridges between the cultures. Um, particularly just because I grew up with that. And um, you know, when I when I went to college, I had a lot of African American friends and um you know, I still saw within my community how there's a lot of stereotypes and I was really bothered by that and I wanted to be an advocate. And then, you know, talking to them, I would hear the same from their side um, towards, you know, uh, you know, brown folk. So I was like, wow, okay, let's let's talk about this. In this, in this body of work I created in um, the next year in 2018, there were some shootings that were happening in Monrovia. Um, they were gang related, but some of the some of the 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 casualties um, were not gang members, and uh, it was really racially charged. And so I wanted to create these memorial sweaters um, towards these individuals that had passed away. And so I thought, well, I want to use the same vernacular that I remember as a kid, you know um you know growing up like as david was talking about through the period that you know after the 70s and the 80s um they would make these sweaters with these iron on um sort of lettering when someone with the from the neighborhood would pass by so um and this one these this is uh 
sort of like uh, Norteño sort of gangs uh, uh, from north, you know, I think, you know, San Francisco or Oakland, I'm not, I'm not sure, but, um, but anyway, uh, well, this little kid has a Oakland, Oakland t-shirt, so it's probably around Oakland area. But they would have a loving memory of the person and they'll give the neighborhood and, and you know, rest in peace. So that's what I did. In loving memory of Sanders Rollins, rest in peace, 1-3-2018, uh, 2008, excuse me, uh, Samantha Salas and Brandon Lee. There was like a, a, a fourth person that got shot, but they survived. It was at the time, my, my wife was, she's a social worker and she was working in the, uh, in that community and, and, that kid that sh that got shot, she was working with, which was, um, I don't know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it a little bit more. And again, you know, it was sort of clandestine. I didn't ask for permission or whatever, um, but they lasted there for a month. The first one that was let that they came down was this Brandon Lee one that was to the far right, um, and I believe it came down because. Um, he got shot nearby. My hope is that somebody from the family took it, you know, and, and has it. Um, but they lasted for quite some time. In that same sort of like vein, I'm still like exploring these tensions between both of these cultures. Um, and I did this video with a friend of mine, uh, Nate Young, who's another amazing artist out in Chicago now from Minnesota, an African-American artist. And, uh, and it was really about violence. Uh, in this video, um, we both have these chocolate guns. We point them at each other, uh, and then we start eating them. Um, so the the concept is that uh, we have in our society, particularly within within our both our cultures, it's like there's there's violence. Um, violence is glorified, but at some point it's too much and um, we just can't hold it down. So in the video, I start being nasty, uh, start getting nausea and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I'll just show you a clip real, real quick. It's pretty much quiet. And then, then we start. So that's the idea behind that. Uh, and it didn't taste good. You might think it did, but you know, it's like, oh, chocolate. That might be a fun project. No, the, the chocolate was bitter. It wasn't, it wasn't good. Um, around the, you know, this is around 2010. Like one of the first shows I had with the gallery I show right now, a Charlie James Gallery. Um, I wanted to create more work about the same topic. And so... Um, I created this sort of like, um, again, this sort of 1980s vibe of, of you know, black power, empowerment, and, and um, you know, you know, also looking at Africa. And uh, this piece is called Before and After Columbus. This is an actual pre-Columbian pot uh, that I got from Guatemala, which is where my family's from. And I painted this sort of iconic image on it. And uh, it's saying that this connection between both of these cultures is not something new. It's something that's been going on for quite some time. Um, I'll talk about this one because uh, um, David had talked about it. This is my project that I did at, at Project Row Houses. Um, we got invited to, you know, Project Row Houses is in Texas. There are these shotgun houses that have been transformed into exhibition spaces, um, which I completely love because it's a, it's not not a museum space, but it's a, um, a, a space that's accessible to you know people in the community. And uh, Rick Lowe, who started the the whole thing, essentially just kind of good for all of you to 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 know about. Um, he had a studio visit and he was showing his work and the work was amazing dealing with social issues and everything. And one of the kids in that, in that meeting said, 
well, this is all good, but how does that help our community? And that just like stuck with him, like, oh. And he started Project Row Houses. And essentially uh, what it is, is there's different components. It's it's this sort of community development project in the shape of an artwork. That's what it pretty much is. So these shotgun houses are exhibition spaces. There's like a young mothers program as well, helping young mothers. And there's there's other things that is happening that are connected with the community that 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 are um, that are helpful to the community. So in these shotgun houses, they have these these exhibitions. Uh, the outside of this window is uh, painted purple. Uh, purple is the color for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and it was essentially it was happening at this time that I was there. I forget the month that it falls on, but as you walk into the house, um, you see I painted two murals, one in the back and, and one in the one on one wall, and one on the other. Um, and the this project is called "Until the Day Breaks and the Shadows Flee," two thousand and ten. So the idea um, is um, this whole concept. Um, I think it, the 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 text "Until the Day Breaks and Shadows Flee" comes from the Bible somewhere. I remember reading it somewhere. Um, but this whole idea until the you know, that you're going through a very difficult situation and at some point, but at some point, the day's going to break and the shadows are going to flee and there's going to be another point. And, and people who are, uh, I worked as a behavioral specialist for like over 14 years. And at this point, I was working with um, survivors of domestic violence and, um, and you know, just just hearing their stories, you know, of, a lot of them, they're survivors and what they had to do to survive. They got through it, but it was a very rough situation. This is a, a little bit more of a close-up. Here's the other side. It's kind of hard to see. Maybe you could see my cursor. I drywalled the, the window. One of these windows, I drywall. It's back here. And then the door to go outside is here. Okay. Um. And these shirts that are in the middle, they were done by the survivors of, of domestic violence. Um, it you know when you look at these, they're pretty pretty intense. Um, what is in these shirts? See another view. If you see that one to the right of upper right. Um, it's a man pointing a gun at this lady and there's a child and it seems like it's like a winter time um when you might think of christmas in this situation is like you 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 see these sort of you see this sort of scene the one to the left they did like this woman and it says protected by domestic violence advocates and in the bottom it says love me don't hurt me in the back wall here all these scenes the idea behind this is I wanted to create, uh, I was looking at a lot of these uh, graphic novels from, from Latin America, particularly Mexico. And um, what I was doing is selecting images and re, um, recontextualizing and taking away the text so you don't know what it's being said, but you see it, you understand. Um, like for instance, the set to the right, you have um, you have a man that's coming in and grabbing his wife or whoever by the hair and applying force. The one in the center, you have a woman opening the door and her friend looking at her, and you could tell she has a black eye. And the one to the left is the all. Oh, all common situation of, you know, the mother being distressed and the son just like crying with her, um, you know, hoping that the situation would change, you know. Let's see here. Let's go back. All right. Uh, these are just like close ups. Working on these sort of projects, um, 
I, you know, for the sake, I, I was out at Houston for like about a week. Um, I had a lot of assistants that helped me out. Actually, one of them that actually helped me out, which is really interesting, she became a curator. And uh, this is why I was telling you the way things work. And she just did a studio visit with me last month uh, for this project where she's at, which I found really interesting. She says, you know what? I remember working on that with you. I said, really? Yeah, I was out in Houston. You know, it's like, wow, that is so cool. Um, but it's the way things work. And then uh, for Made in LA, we have a biennial here, which is like in New York, um, the Whitney Biennial. Here we have, you know, Made in LA, which it's a biennial that happens at the Hammer Museum, uh, showcasing, you know, all, you know, um, showcasing artists that are from Los Angeles. Um, so it's a quite, quite an honor to be included in that show. And I created a larger version of that that dealt with domestic violence, and it was like pretty big. But part of that, um, here you see another angle of how big it is. Uh, part of that, there's also, um, well, actually, I, I, it'll, it'll come next. I did this rug that went with this show, but I included this one in here just because it was uh, similar to that. This was Until the Day Breaks and Shadows Flee number two. This was until the day breaks and shadows flee. Number two, number two. This one was number three. I mean, excuse me. This one's number three. This one's number two because the second one I did. Um, and essentially, this was outside in a house across the street from a school uh, in Pasadena. Okay, so um, essentially, this one is 2012, made in LA. Uh, created this rug. Is made out of sawdust uh, and uh, dyed sawdust. And it was about nine feet wide by 23 feet long. And a lot of the text that's in here deals with um, domestic violence. So uh, one of the texts reads, Madreame de besos, no de trancasos. Beat me up with kisses, not with punches. Then it says he won't, he says it won't happen again. And then machismo mata todos los días. Machismo kills every single day. And the top one says no more per no more hurt, pain, or violence. And at some point, you know, people walked over the rug. And uh, that was the end. And this is the end result. So now a lot of people look at these and say like, oh, they destroyed it, you know. Um, but traditionally that's not the concept of these rugs they're they're not necessarily destroyed the 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 tradition of of these rugs um many cultures do it i'm my my family were from guatemala and essentially they do these for holy week uh what they call semana santa uh or you know palm sunday uh in the narrative in the biblical narrative they would lay down these sort of palms and it was a, you know, it was a time where Christ was, you know, going through the town and uh, with a donkey and they will say, Hosanna, Hosanna, the highest, you know, you know, glorifying him. Um, so in these towns, which are very religious, they have these processions and uh, they carry like a Christ-like figure or, or a saint and people spend a lot of time working these to welcome these characters and of course as they step on it you know they deteriorate but it's this whole notion of uh labor being involved um in honor of somebody right that they respect and here will be you know a, a christ-like figure or virgin or what have you in my in my version you know uh the the concept is I'm doing it in honor of not this religious figures, but in honor of people who have um, suffered from domestic violence, right? And for them to walk on it is like bringing the peace into uh, into completion. Um, it's it's almost like 
saying, I hear you, I see you. That's that's what for me, that's what feels like. I think all of us um either know or have experienced domestic violence or or just are just part of it, just because uh, just the fact of being human beings, right? So that was the concept behind that. And here's a little bit of the process. I lay down uh, with assistance. We lay down a, a bed of sawdust to make it fluffy. And then uh, we start um, using stencils and start uh, creating the piece and uh, so on and so forth. Um, let me see, I'll skip this, but I'll just flip through some images so you can see the variety and breadth of what I do. These are like textile pieces that are on the wall and some, you know, textile uh, kind of sculptural piece that's it's a good size. Um, all I would say about this, well, I'll talk a little bit about this. Just I'm kind of going some things with my father um, ill at the moment. Um, and um, it's in the hospital. So, I mean, when I first thought about this, it's certain things I thought about in relationship to my father. So I guess I should talk about it. Um, but it was really about absent fathers, absentee fathers, and just struggling with the idea of fatherhood and, and just having positive role models. I worked as a behavioral specialist. So I worked with a lot of, a lot of youth. Um, the, the young boy that's in the middle is a kid that I work with. And um, this piece is called The Alphabet is Full of Characters. And essentially what I was looking at here is the, the idea that um, a young child has potential to have influences from different things. Some of them are, you know, uh, superheroes, uh, which could be like a Spider-Man or, or a Rey Mysterio. Um, some of them are political figures, sports figures, preachers, you know or gang members, uh, comedians. Um, so I wanted to have this sort of breadth of possible influences uh, within that. And it's essentially what happens to us when we're kids. Uh, I had a lot of good mentors um, and uh, that were a positive influence in my life. So I wanted to include that. You see a little bit there, you know, cotton tapestries that, you know, that are made. And then happy, happy Father's Day, Mom is kind of like looking at the piece. You know, most of the time we'll celebrate these these holidays based on you know the sexes, and in here it's you know really based on essentially a mother that had to play all these sort of roles. Which you know, I mean, I I I, I could see it different ways. You know, I I see it I see it different way. You know, I mean. Um, I definitely believe that, uh, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, just thinking about my situation, I think my mother's experience was very unique in the things that she did. Um, so it's just, you know, I mean, it's a nod for me for people who don't, the way I was looking at it, my, my dad was around, but it's a nod for people that don't have their father and you have mothers that are, you know, trying to fit all the roles that, you know, uh, their child should, should have. And then this was kind of me looking at the idea of, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big sculpture. Anyway, so this was this whole notion of me um, uh, creating this piece, um, remembering the toys that I had as a little kid. So uh, essentially, this is a uh, textile um, from Guatemala and it has this sort of like figure um, which essentially would be um, sewn in. So the, the, the idea is that we have little, as we grow up, it's called all grown up, never grow up. It's like we grow up, but we still carry these sort of traumas and experiences from when we were a little kid. That was the whole notion of that. And then this the sculpture in the background uh, deals with this whole idea of of celebrating fatherhood, but also, um, all, all, you know, I mean, when you're when you're uh, it's a, supposed to symbol like a piñata, and uh, with a piñata, it's like you you hit it 
So in essentially you, you, you're using it to celebrate, but you hit it and you're destroying it at the same time. So in, in my culture, Papi, you know, I mean, there's two, two major things. I think, you know, sometimes it could be seen as like this sort of like a partner telling their lover Papi, like, uh, you know, more like an endearment sort of thing. But generally speaking, it's, it's, you know, in Central America, it's what we call our father, Papi, and what we call our son when he's a little guy. We call him Papi is like little daddy or whatever, you know. So that was the, the concept and the idea behind this, this piece. Uh, I'll skip these. This is essentially the same thing here. I'll, I'll talk about this. This is a little body of work I did with my son, uh, things I learned from my dad and TV. Um, essentially, I collaborated with him. Uh, so when you know young kids are small, they have certain influences. Some, excuse me, some of these influences are superheroes, things that they watch. So, you know, I grew up in the 80s, you know, early 90s. Um so I was watching a lot of things. So there's some, you know, some references that we watched together. Um, like this one to the left, which was really interesting when he drew it. I said, man, what is this egg-shaped character that my son drew? And I talked to him. He says, oh, no, that's Darth Vader without his mask. And I said, like, oh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And then so I put this, I love you, I love you, Luke. And then he was doing this sort of like um, Buzz Lightyear and Woody. And uh, I said, okay, um, I put this sort of like a um, flower that's protecting Buzz from getting wet, but Woody doesn't care because he loves him so much. So again, I'm, I'm exploring these sort of like ideas of love with these sort of th these characters. The one to the left is another version of Spider-Man, which, became balloon spider-man and then the one to the right is a i don't know who that little character is in the back but he just drew him in there and then he drew what he believed to be the incredible hulk uh so i drew this grocery bag thinking the incredible hulk brought in these groceries um which i really which i really loved um like another spider-man can i do anything for a for you and I guess this is a sort of like a Jesus sort of figure. I don't know what the zero one means up there. He didn't either. He didn't, he didn't remember. But um, and then this is this is him at the time. And I drew him holding this little dinosaur. Uh, the one to the left is a Captain American shield, which deals with America. But I put a, the eye of a woman. Uh, I think the piece is called, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman, you know. And the one to the right uh, is is it's like a, he was a little bit younger. I, collect, I collected these sketches for a while, and uh, and then the 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 characters E T. So this is called E T Love. And then the right Power Ranger mask, and I drew myself in it. To the left, it's kind of like this joke. Uh, Donde esta Obi Juan el Kenobi? You know, of course, Obi Wan Kenobi, but Donde esta means where is Obi Juan, the one that cannot see? That's what it says. You know, so it's kind of like this little joke, right? Um, I'll skip this body of work. You know, I do photography and painting. These are oil paintings. Let me see. I'll skip this to large drawings. I'll talk about this one. This one's um uh the this is another rug, but I was looking for a way to make these rugs a little bit more permanent. Um, so I decided it, you know. I remember looking at these, I don't know how it came to be, but I was looking at these welcome mats at Ikea and they look like rugs. And then I started putting them together. I said, well, I could create a large rug with this. So these are created out of 15, uh, you know, welcome mats. It's coconut hair, right? Coconut core, 
I think that's how you say it in, la in latex. Um, and then I use the same process, but now I'm, instead of putting the sawdust, I'm spraying acrylic, um, acrylic spray paint on them. And this one was really dealing with um, the idea of police brutality or the, the you know, the, the time this was in 2015 when I, when I did this and a lot of things were popping up. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, um, and I wanted to combine them to 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 express the sentiment from both cultures. Again, looking at solidarity between brown and black communities. So the concept of our lives matter, you know, people who are being, you know, um, uh, going through this sort of racial profiling and police brutality. And uh, we can't breathe as well. Uh, so uh, on the outside, you have this sort of like um, icon iconography of a panther referencing the Black Panther and also this iconography of the eagle, which in some respect, res respects, definitely in a big respect, it references the United Farm Workers, but um, where I was really focusing on was uh, the Brown Berets, which also used this eagle. A lot of Chicano groups use the, you know, the, the eagle in their iconography as well. Another view, more detail. All right, uh, okay. So this is kind of going into more or less where I'm at right now. I've been working on these watercolor paintings um, I first started doing them in 2018. This is an image of, a vintage image of the Statue of Liberty from uh, circa 1898. And uh, when you go inside, there's going to be a, a plaque um, that commemorates the poem, The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. It's at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you probably know some of these words before. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these to me. Um, very famous words. She was a Jewish poet. And um, essentially, she was sort of talking about migration, particularly through Ellis Island, through this sort of area. And the poem is really quite beautiful um, in what she was, you know, trying to uh, say in there, essentially painting the, the woman from the Statue of Liberty of this very, like this mother figure, very loving, very welcoming um, sort of figure, having this torch lighting the way for those that are lost, for those that are refugees, for those that are migrating, so on and so forth. So I wanted to include that within these works and start doing these paintings um, where I was including um, the text of the poem into the actual paintings. And of course, I have another rug that I did in this, this sort of environment. And of course, you know, working in this, the back room here. with these, these signs, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is one of the pieces. This is um, Immigrant Landscape number six. Uh, watercolor on paper. Uh, essentially, these are the, the studies for the border walls. And in the poem, it talks about the gold. I lift my lamp besides the golden door. The golden door is a go the door of opportunity, a door that allows people in. So. I wanted to have these sort of two things next to each other, the idea of, a, a, you know, a door being something that's welcoming on a wall that is, that is keeping people out, right? So uh, those two things, of course, this is all fictional. Uh, it's, it's like someone came in and graffitied that. That's the idea. This one's another painting I did. Uh, immigrant landscape number seven, and this one is a uh, border patrol agent car. And on the back of the bumper, uh, there's this sort of like a uh, sticker 
It says mother of exiles. And again, it's like these things wouldn't be there. They're fictional, but I, I guess wishful thinking, right? And then these signs would say something like illegal immigration activity happens here. Please be careful. Uh, but I changed that into the give me your tired or poor, your huddle massive journey to breathe free. Essentially, we want them, you know. Immigrant landscape number four, from her beacon hand glows worldwide, worldwide welcome. This is on the Statue of Liberty. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. I mean, I know like uh, as an artist, you know, I talk about these sort of things that could be very polemic. Um, there's different points of views. I try to approach it in a very poetic way. I don't want to necessarily use a hammer and say like, F you this, F that, you know. I, I really want to just create these these pieces that make you think about these sort of topics. And, um, you know, immigration is, is a very, it's a very difficult one. I definitely, I'm not the position that, hey, just open the borders and let everybody in. We shouldn't have anything. But I think that, you know, we have to really humanely think about this situation. I think a lot of times it's fueled by racist sort of sentiments, which are unfortunate. And, um, and you know, um, and understand that there, that we have a bigger role that we play as the United States and how, you know, we've intervened with a lot of these third world countries that are struggling as well. Um, all of that is is important when, when we're talking about this conversation. And when this work, I just hope to bring attention. Nonetheless, you know, and this is the, the thing that I've always struggled, particularly, you know, growing up as a person of faith and uh, seeing a lot of, you know, people within, you know, the Christian community who um, don't exemplify those sort of values and how they, you know, I, I remember hearing like chants, send them home, send them home, get him out of here, you know? And I was like, wow, that doesn't seem to fit to me, you know? So um, those are the things that fuel me as an artist to create work. This one is uh, one of the, one of the uh, biggest cause, causes of um, uh, deaths and crossing the desert is dehydration. A lot of times, you know, um, individuals would, would would pass and they couldn't identify them. So they will create these uh, markers um, or these little uh, grave sites. And they'll create these markers with, uh, with bricks or they'll put like these uh, sort of like tin uh, or aluminum signs to, um, to mark their grave sites. And a lot of times, they'll say Jane Doe or an identified person, unknown person, unknown female. So in here, I just put this whole this, this whole text of her mild eyes, just thinking about it in terms of, of you know, this is what the, the, the terminology that was used to describe the Statue of Liberty. So I found that really beautiful just to think of someone who passed having these mild eyes, which is... Uh, very pleasant sort of like trait or, or or like characteristic to think of. And then from that, I created this rug, a memorial to three unknown females from 2016. Um, in it, I document just thinking about these three unknown females that, that passed away as they were um, crossing the border, which, you know, it just made me think of like, wow, you know, it's like, we don't know who they are. So I want to create a memorial uh, for them with this rug. Um, so you have these sort of flowers and you have this sort of like dove of hope that's on the outside, or maybe a bird that that guides through this journey. Um, the signs that you see to the right is more or less how these they're going to look like. John Doe, and they just have a catalog number and the location, right? At some point, like in uh, 2014, within this image, we have um, University of Indianapolis students um, using shovels and hand tools to try to do some forensic archaeology. Um, 
and this is in a in a park in in uh, in uh, Falfurias, Texas. Um, so the the idea is because these bodies they were so deteriorated they couldn't identify who they are. Now they they're on you know they're digging them up to do some DNA testing so they could sort of um, figure out who they who they were and let their family let the family members know so that they 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 could um, have some rest you know knowing that um, what really happened because a lot of them still think oh they just disappeared I don't know where they're at right and and in that show I had these sort of signs that were these markers that were done by by the children of immigrants so like i would be one of them right um giving thanks to their parents for the sacrifices they they made so uh, this one says my father was a <clears throat> was my father was a bracero he suffered a lot he was far from his family in mexico but convinced a good religious man to build a home for his family and brought his family home to the u.s Years later, my mother cleaned other people's combs and ironed other people's clothes. I stand proud every day because of them, and I'm proud to be an immigrant as well. The Bracero program was a program. If you look into it, it's really interesting. This is where history like plays an important role, where you know individuals were brought over to work, legally brought over to work, with the notion that they would get citizenship, or you know, after putting some time in but a lot of those things weren't you weren't honored and a lot of those people were were kicked back this as well after that time was done which is very horrible history in the united states here's mine my mother became an orphan at the age of 12 and was raised by her older brothers since work was scarce in her hometown she decided to leave her siblings to survive she immigrated from guatemala to the u.s to see to seek a better life she married my father and worked cleaning houses to provide for my brother and me. I'm thankful for for sacrifice. Ng ngl, and all these signs are have colors. They're basically the colors of the places. So this is Mexico. Um, this one could be Venezuela, Colombia. They share the same colors. This one, Guatemala, El Salvador. I don't give locations, but you kind of get the idea from that. Uh, we're running out of time, but I'll just talk about this one last project. Uh, this is a project uh, auto sculpture I did in Borrego Springs. And essentially, um, I was asked to come out here and do a public art project um, that deals with community or the site. And so I visited uh, the Borrego Springs High School. And a large percentage in the 90s are either immigrants or children of immigrants. And I was like, why is that so? Well, it turns out that uh, a lot of it's it's one of those vacation towns, and uh, so but you know there's the hotel industry, landscaping, food industry. They need people to fill those jobs. So a lot of them, it's people come from Mexico, from these particular towns in Mexico, um, and uh, and work there, and they have kids, and then the kids go to the high school, and the majority of them, you know, their parents are immigrants, so. They didn't know their narratives. So like 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 the tablets I did with those signs, I had them create their own narratives and stories. And so they talked to their parents and, um, you know, they wrote their narratives in there. And in this sculpture, uh, people have to kind of go underneath, kind of like when you're crossing and then you go in between things, you know, um, could be like hiding or whatever. It gives you that, that whole experience of migrating. And then, um, and then when you read this narrative, you read about uh, history. So that's like leaving things behind, you know. More shots. So it's in the middle of the desert. Uh, I'll show you this video. It should be quick. Let's check it out. I think art can do so much in people's lives to help bring some understanding of the world. The stories are what's important to me. Okay, let's move towards you a little bit. Pick it up. The idea of beneath, between, and behind 
is the journey that happens into coming to a new place. You go beneath, between things, and you leave things behind. The act of actually crouching down, it, it puts us in a space to be able to experience something. As you go in, you're gonna see all these tablets and they're the narratives from the students from Borrego Springs High School. Screw that in and then do two, two sides at a time. I'm just presenting these narratives and my hope is to humanize people. It's good. I like it's it. It's really good. When you can relate to somebody, you gravitate to, to that person. Let's agree to understand each other. Within this work, that's, that's my hope. All right, so that's that. Put that there. Um, move on. So it's right at 12. Um, and that was my presentation. Um, this is my information. If you all want to stay in touch, uh, it's my email. That's my website and uh, my handle for Instagram. I usually like telling students, please stay in touch. If you have any questions, if you want to follow up with anything, I'm available to you. Um, I know how it is to be a student. When I was in school, I did that. I, I looked at artists that I was influenced by. And then um, I just said, hey, look, you know, I'm a, I'm a grad student. I've admired your work for some time. Um, do you mind if I just pick your brain a little bit and and kind of see where, you know, how you got to where you're you're at? And, you know, some people would not respond or some people, oh, I don't got time, but you'll be surprised. I did have a lot that did. So uh, please take that chance. Please do those things. I do that with my students. It's an assignment. I have them reach out to people. Uh, but stay in touch. Great. <laughs> well, Neri, this was really a fantastic uh, to, chance to get uh, inside some of these works that are, I think are fabulous. And I really, really like the work that you did for the festival in uh, near Borrego Springs. Uh, I think it's kind of, it's very heartwarming and touching uh, and <clears throat> must have been particularly meaningful for you to, since your, your, your uh, mom uh, came up from Guatemala and f followed some of that same path. Uh, did your did your mom and 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 dad come up uh, kind of following the kind of legal, or did they come up following the kind of like uh, do it yourself method? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there is a lot of more uh, freedom and in, in traveling. I think my dad, I think my dad just, I, I don't know, I, it was just he just crossed, and it was like whatever, it wasn't a big deal, you know. My mom did didn't did did it uh, illegally. Um, and then they met up over here. They didn't meet uh -huh. over there. Yeah, yeah so no, it's, both of them had different experiences. You know, it's the, it's it's because it's the American experience at this point, and it's one yeah. that we should uh, you know be proud of people who wanted who wanted so much to find a better life uh, yeah. to to create families and and the like. So, I, I think you your work reflects really beautifully on that, and and also on the danger of it, and on the dangers of domestic violence and and the like. I'm really okay. glad we could present your work today. Uh, okay. So this is um, so we're going to we're going to uh, uh, to to end our program uh, here in a second or or two, uh, and um, uh, I can say that um, that. Uh, next week, uh, see, next week is the seventh, right? Yeah, next week is the seventh. We'll be we'll we'll have as our artist um, a a woman from New Orleans named Don Dido, and that ought to be quite interesting. And the following uh, the following week, we'll have Ahmed Oget from from Istanbul. Uh, so again, thank you, Neri. We'll see you on the other side with the students for our uh, for our conversations. And so, for, uh, thank you to all of those of you who were. We're watching and uh, you can join us again next week. It'll be at uh, our regular time at five o'clock uh, with Don Dido. So thank you and goodbye. And Neri, see you in a few minutes in the other site. Take care.